Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Alchemy Lab with me, Colm Holland. And um, I'm the guy, if you remember, uh, who published this book called The Secret of the Alchemist. That's me, Colm Holland. Yes, you can see the, the illustration on the back there just to remind us all. But the main reason that we're here today, and I'm really excited about this, is that we've got a fantastic guest whose name is Lionel. Hi, Lionel. Freeberg. Hi, how are you? Hi, Colm. Uh, I'm fine. Thank you very much. And um, hello to everybody. Hi. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm in, in the UK near Glastonbury and you're all the way over in California, just on the outskirts of Los Angeles. So I'm at one end of the day and you're on the other. But it's wonderful to have you here. And I'm thrilled that we're going to be able to talk about your new book. Just for everyone's benefit, uh, Lionel, has spent his life in film. And it's an amazing career in film that, that Lionel's had. Uh, and he's written about this in a new book called Forever in My Veins. So it, uh, that's definitely um, a topic that we want to explore a bit further there, Lionel. Um, so welcome. Um, I'm going to start off by literally asking you to explain um, what, what the title of your book means and uh, how you came to write it. Well, there could be a number of ways of looking at the title. Um, Forever in My Veins is the essence of storytelling and film and seeking the truth, because although my background is as a director of photography on feature films, I eventually fell in love with documentaries. So I've spent over 40 years making documentaries and it's, it's something that is really, it defines who you are. Um, I am a filmmaker, you know, and then secondly, I'm me. But the first thing that I am is a filmmaker, trying to reflect the world, the planet and interpreting it for others as I perceive it, as I see it, or as it is given to me. So that's one side of the forever in my veins. But the other side of the forever in my veins meaning is that I, I was born and grew up in South Africa. And although I've been living here in uh, Los Angeles, which is virtually the center of the film industry, as everyone knows, for the last 36 years and have done pretty well and worked for most of the major documentary houses, including, you know, the Discovery Channel, National Geographic and others. Who I am is really defined by, by my African roots. Hmm. I feel the essence of the continent has dictated who and what I am in so many ways. The, um, the, 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 the tribal culture, the, the essence of, of the continent itself, its mystique, its mysticism, its mysteries. Africa is an incredible place. Yeah. It's like wandering through an endless museum of wonder. It really is an extraordinary. I was watching the other night, uh, David Attenborough's uh, film, his sort of life testament. Yeah. And, and I thought I can totally relate to that because I feel the same way about Africa. And I've seen the continent change so much uh, since I grew up and went to school there and made films there and looking back on it. But it really has defined who I am. And I think that I, ca I carry those values, those qualities, if you like, uh, um, with me throughout whatever I do, whether I'm working on a Hollywood soundstage or I've done a few films with NASA and JPL, the Jet Propulsion uh, Lab in Pasadena. So even if you're, I'm in places like that, I'm still an African. And, yeah. and, 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 I, and I refer back to those values. Those are my strengths. Those are the hooks on which I've, I have hung the things that I grab for when I need them, you know, whether it's it. or truth or whatever. So that's what the title uh, infers. So you were born and grew up in Johannesburg, correct? I grew up in the Johannesburg area, yes. Uh, born just to the south of Johannesburg um, in a place called Germiston. Uh, but I grew up in that, in that area. There's another little town called Kempton Park, which is where the major international airport is today. Right. Oliver Tambo Airport. Uh, um, I went to school there and grew up in Germiston, but I lived in Johannesburg for, for many years. My father moved around a lot for various okay. business reasons. And that's, so that's my beat. Okay, I'm sure we're gonna, we've got some South African listeners and, and viewers on here today. So they'll, I'm sure they'll know exactly where you mean. I've, so my real question is, why did you write this book? What, 
forever in my veins. Can you be a bit more specific about what well, inspired you to to put this? It's because essentially, what from my reading of it, it's very much a personal story, but it's got so much more to it. You know, um, I don't want to sound, and and it's 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 very easy to to go that route. I, I'm boastful, if you like. Um, <laughs> no, please, we don't mind that at all. <laughs> But it's, it's not about that. I, I, I look back at my life. I'm, I'm now 76 years old. Um, yeah. And I look back at my life and I think, oh, my goodness gracious me, what an absolutely extraordinary life I've had. I've been blessed. Yes. I really have been blessed to have an amazing life that has taken me down so many main side, side roads and, and byways uh, throughout the planet that I wanted to share that. I just wanted to share that with people and talk about some of the extraordinary people that I've met on, on my way. Uh, as yeah. I, as I, I as want I, to ask you about one of those. There's one in, okay. Yeah. So throughout the book, you say, and I'm, I'm quoting now, that, that everything came to pass in your life during your career, that everything that did come to pass in your life was actually foretold when you were about 20 years old uh, by a, a nanga, uh, do you want to tell us what a nanga is and what she said? I don't want to spoil the book because everybody, you do need to go and buy Lionel's book. I'm not, we're not going to tell you the story here because that, that's going to be a real spoiler. And this is a filmmaker. We don't do spoilers. So, well, um, you know, unlike, unlike uh, somebody like Bryson, who, who, who could <laughs> yeah. you know, go, go, go down a road and tell you and fill a whole book about that. Yeah. I needed to find a through line, if you like, okay. to link all the events together. Mm -hmm. um, how do I connect Hollywood with Botswana and 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 safaris and mm -hmm. um, the, the things that I've done in Africa and Antarctica and other places where I have made films? What is the through line? What is the link? And it, it's it was a very 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 simple answer, because when I uh, developed a kidney disease about twenty six years ago. Okay. Um, in fact, it was a very interesting situation. I describe it in the book. We were sitting, watching uh, a television one night and I, it was a very hot Californian evening and I was wearing shorts. And my wife looked down at my feet and she said, why are your feet so swollen tonight? Your ankles are all swollen. And I looked down and I thought, I I've never noticed that before. So I went to see my doctor and within a week, I'd had a biopsy and I, it was discovered that I had a chronic kidney condition. Oh dear. And uh, it completely sh sh shook my life. It, it, it changed my life entirely. It really was like an earthquake. And then I suddenly realized something and I thought, oh my God, why, I, why does this surprise me? This was mm -hmm. predicted. And I went back into my memory banks and my notes and I keep copious notes. I write down everything, by the way, every single thing that I do, every film I make, every trip I take, I write everything down. And I went back into my notes and I went back into my memory banks and I, I had realized that all of this was prophesized uh, many, many years ago in 1964 by an albino woman in Zambia who did not even speak English. And I'll tell you the circumstances as to how this happened. Um, my, my family moved, my father, I'm an only child. So my parents eventually moved to what was then Northern Rhodesia, this was colonial days. And in 1961, they moved up there uh, to the Copper Belt, which is an area just to the south of the Congo border. Wonderful forested area, thick with lush vegetation. And my father moved up there to run a small business um, for various reasons. But the, one of the main reasons why they decided, my folks decided to leave South Africa is that we had had enough of apartheid. It was pretty ugly and it was terrible. And it was the, the time of um, uh, Henrik Favut, people who may remember the name, uh, who was the, the, the architect of the grand design of apartheid, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. separating the races and then giving it this false idea of separate development in order yeah. to give it uh, justification, which of course wasn't the case at all. And I try and describe that in the book too. So we moved to Northern Rhodesia and, 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 and you know, I, my, my mother was saying, you should actually, it's time for you to go to university. You finish your high school, everything's done. What do you want to do? Well, 
I fell in love with making movies when I was 11 years old. Okay. And I had been making eight millimeter films <clears throat> for my school, for my friends, for myself. Have you still uh, got them, Lionel? Have you still got those? I, I still have them. I, I, there's no way that I can run them because, you know, I do have a couple of projectors, but the projector lamp is the problem. Oh. And, and at some point, uh, I need to take them to a, a professional house here in LA and have them converted. Yeah, you're in the right place, surely. <laughs> yes, it's, 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 not, it's not a cheap process, which is why I haven't done it yet. I do, I would love to do that and con convert them all. And anyway, so um, I moved up there with my parents and I thought, when I arrived there, I thought this is terribly exciting. And I thought, well, I have my little eight millimeter camera. Now it's my chance to make King Solomon's Mines and the African Queen and all those wonderful films that I adored as a child. <laughs> And um, I looked around this place, and of course, it, these were these were mining towns. There was no film industry. There was nothing of substance that appealed to me. My world didn't exist there. There was Africa, and there was mining. What am I going to do here? And then, fortuitously, like manna from heaven, one day there was a little ad in the local newspaper where they were looking for staff for a new television station. Wow. Well, this for me was like the best thing that could possibly happen. The universe was watching over me. And so the very, very first television station in Central Africa uh, was in Kitwe. This was, I think it was even before Nairobi. Um, it was, yeah, it was before, I, anyway, it's 1961. And um, I, I, I went, to see them and I um, interviewed and they said, well, you know, most of the staff are coming from the UK and a few of the people are coming from what was then known as Southern Rhodesia, now mm. known as Zim Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe yeah. uh, because Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia and Nyasaland, which is today Malawi, we used to be a part of a federation, yeah. uh, a, a British federation. Um, and um, and, and so um, the, the staff was all being hired from the UK and from Southern Rhodesia. And they said, we've got one or two minor jobs. And uh, they really are for local people, you know, for black people, essentially, they were saying. And I said, I'll take anything. I'll sweep the floor. I don't care anything. Anyway, the man who managed the station, he was an ex-captain um, 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 from the British Army wonderful man, terribly eccentric man. And he said, well, you know, young man, there's a job here for a props man, a property person That's to good. look after the property. Why? Because they had live advertising. We didn't have a commercial film industry. If local companies wanted to advertise, it would be live. So you'd, you'd, you'd bring a car into the studio or a, a radiogram or a television set or whatever. And it would be advertised on a live advertising magazine program. Um, and so there was the prop room where we, we kept all these props and they gave me that job. And I thought, this is absolutely wonderful. And I, I, uh, I joined the station. I helped them, you know, weld all the wires together. And we went on the air officially in December 1961, December the 15th. And the governor general was there and uh, the, the prime minister of the federation was there. It was a big deal. And, you know, the ribbon was cut and the service began. But I after six months, I, I was fed up with doing, dealing with props. And I went along to the studio manager and I said, Mr. Salmon, if you want me to stay, and they did like what I did because I had to invent things. There were times, for example, that you had to create stuff of your own uh, making. There was, a, there was an ice cream company, but they couldn't bring ice cream to the studio because it would melt under the lights. So I found if you put a dishcloth in a, little, in a, in a plate and covered it with motor oil, and it's a black and white television, of course, and put a marble on top. It looks like ice cream. So they thought, <laughs> Just they don't thought, eat oh, it. <laughs> I was inventive and creative. And I said, right, <laughs> if you like what I'm doing, put me behind one of those cameras. Yeah, OK. And Ian Salmon said to me, all right, young man, we'll, we'll give you a chance. You, you, can do, you can do one show and let's see how you are. Well, I was fast. I was good because I'd been making films for a long, long yes. time. I knew yeah. about composition. And I knew how to find images very, very quickly. I'm going to had... interrupt you, though. But how did this get you to the Nanga? How, how... Right. So I'm going there. So, yeah. um, so after having done this for some years, independence eventually comes to Northern Rhodesia. Yep. Britain decides to give Northern Rhodesia its independence. And Kenneth Kaunda becomes the first uh, president of the Republic of Zambia. Yep. And when this was announced, the very, very first thing that was done 
was the new government said to the, the television, the owner of the station, we have to get rid of all the white staff and we have to Zambianize the station. We have to have local people sure. running the show, yeah. which is totally justified and totally understandable. And so I knew that my job was now in jeopardy. I was going to lose it. Um, and I had to train someone. And then what was I going to do? So we had a, everybody in those days had servants, of course. And we had a wonderful guy who was working for us. And I'm talking about my folks and I was still living with my parents at the time. And this man was named David Firi, wonderful man, Bemba speaking man. And he and I often used to talk about photography. And I went to him one day and I said, David, you know, something really terrible has happened. He said, what? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to lose my job because they're going to give my job to a local person. Oh, no, he said, that's very bad. So I said, no, it's not bad, David. It's supposed to be like that. This is your country. This is correct. Yeah. But the big problem is, what am I going to do? I don't want to go back to South Africa. And he said, well, then we need to find the answer as to what you must do. And I said, how are we going to do that? He said, I know someone. And that's how it came about. Okay. In a little blue Volkswagen, we went along this rutted road <laughs> to a mud hut in the see bush. It now. Yeah, I can see it. <laughs> and he introduced me to this woman. And she, uh, and, and let me just say this, that one of the, the, the paradigms that, that the African um, uh, healers and soothsayers, if you like, or fortune tellers or tra traditional healers use, is the bones they they throw bones and stones and the way these these items fall on a grass mat is interpreted as being the way your ancestral spirits have, may have made them fall and each bone and object in the bones has a separate meaning so okay. your ancestors are making the bones fall in a certain pattern okay. and then it's up to the healer to interpret that for you yeah and that's what this woman did and you know she was ancient and she was an albedo and it was a terribly hot day and she was wearing all these coats and had a rug around her it was a very strange experience in this dark shadowy hut and she threw the bones and david interpreted for me and i made notes of not everything that she told me i wish i did but the key points that she told me all came to pass over my life every single thing including she, including the illness towards the end of your life yes. which is what, where you Absolutely. so what did she say about that how did she describe well, she that said, she said you, she told me she said to, to david she was talking to david she said one thing is that one day he's going to get very very sick but if he calls on his ancestors they will help him to survive and they will help him live through this illness it will be very bad that's all i was told and i said to david well you know tell me a little bit more and when will this happen and he asked her and he said she said, when the time is right, it will happen. And he will have to ask his ancestors to help him survive it. And, and I, did you? Did you ask your ancestors? It was did very, very... I mean, I didn't understand any of this from her no. at all, of course. Well, when the illness eventually came, yes, I certainly did call upon my, my guides and my ancestors. Right. And, all, and all the entities that I, you know, have a connection with them. Um, and they uh, have seen me through this illness. In fact, uh, at one point, my, nephro my nephrologist said to me, he said, I walked into his office and he said, God, you're still around. <laughs> you <know? laughs> oh, great. That's, well, that's what you love, a great bedside manner. <laughs> uh, you that's know, hilarious. You, uh, but you should have been in dialysis by now or dead and you're still around. How come? And I said, Doc, you'll never understand it. I tried to uh, explain. Yeah, they're, they're, whole, yeah, because I did go back to Africa, by the way, okay. with with traditional healers. Uh, in when I had this illness, I went back. Oh, that's interesting. Did you go back to South Africa or whereabouts? Well, I have a friend uh, who's also South African, and, he, and he's a general surgeon, and oh. he lives not not terribly far away from here. And he was studying the the African traditional healing system hmm. uh, out of curiosity, and um, he eventually said to me, he said, you know. When I, when I got this illness, he said, let me say something to you that you won't believe coming from a doctor. Why don't you think, why don't you think about going back to South Africa and see if those guys being the, the traditional healers, Oh, wow. Okay. They have anything to offer you. Yeah. And I thought, well, okay, that's, that's 
I'll try that. And um, so I went back with him on one of his research visits and I met a number of extraordinary uh, um, traditional healers. In South Africa, they are known as Sangomas. And I tell you, some of those people are just the most unbelievably insightful people I have ever met. Wonderful people. Yes, they are, of course, the phonies and, and all the rest of it, but as you find in any field. But sure. the ones that I, that I found in the tribal areas were extraordinary people. But going back a little bit in time, in the 1970s, um, when I was back in South Africa, because after I lost my job in Northern Rhodesia, I had to go back to South Africa. I emigrated to Canada. I came to the United States, but I ended up back in Africa eventually. And when, 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 when television finally arrived in South Africa, because it was kept away for as long as possible, because God forbid that the black population should see how the rest of the world can live in peace mm -hmm. without being separated, which is why they kept television away for so long. <laughs> but in 1976, it did arrive. So in 1974, I got a remarkable assignment to do a series of uh, documentaries on the various tribes of Southern Africa with an anthropologist by the name of Peter Becker, who's written extensively on various African healers yeah, yeah. and the Zulu empire and, and so on. And um, so Peter and I and a small crew, we set off into the, into the midst of you know, nowhere and we made these shows about the various tribes in South Africa. And I met a lot of traditional healers during the, the year that it took to film that series. And so I saw what these folks could do I mean, I saw so many examples of illnesses being cured and um, thieves who had stolen something being found out or, you know, st stuff that be had been lost found because the Sangoma saw in the bones exactly where the item was. I mean, all sorts of amazing things <laughs> that were beyond my understanding, but sure. I could see this, 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 this wasn't nonsense. It was so absolutely amazing. So Lionel, you can't live a life like you've had with the experiences that you've had without going through, and, and let's not forget, the alchemy lab where we're talking today is a metaphorical alchemist's laboratory. We believe as alchemists that everything is transforming. Yes. So the reason you can transform lead into gold using their ancient you know, metaphor yeah. is because lead it wants to transform into gold. And so Carl Jung discovered that this was um, a bigger metaphor for an inner transformation that had to take place also within the alchemists themselves. And today that has become commonplace when we talk about our own spiritual growth or our own emotional growth and so on. So can you name for us one or two moments in your amazing journey when there were certain shifts where a transformation that you can remember that that made a difference to your life which meant in a way that you lived your life differently from from the way it was before um you know there were so many of those and of course you add them all up and they make a huge difference, but individually they make small differences. They, they small, you. small differences are fine. We're all, we're all doing small differences every day. So. They, they, they shift you in little ways. They push yeah. you in one direction and then, but, but together they compound together and to make enormous differences in your life. So I, you know, um, let me give you an example of something that happened um, in 1967. I got a job to go on a safari with a group of American hunters to Mozambique. This was uh, the, 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 the man who was the, the head of this group of three people, three uh, guys from LA went to um, uh, Mozambique to an enormous hunting concession in the middle of the country. This was before the Mozambique civil war burst out and before the Portuguese uh, left and before the country before, became- Before and, conservation, probably as well. And long before conservation also, exactly, yes. So I'm talking about 1967. And, um, and on that particular trip, I was, I, I have always been very anti-hunting or any kind of anti 
any kind of exploitation of animals of any sort whatsoever, ever since I was a child. In fact, uh, I, I turned vegetarian um, in 1965 and have been ever since. I don't, I don't even eat them. I, I, I can't bear the thought of even Same going. Yeah. Um, I can't. In fact, today I'm I'm 100% vegan. I don't even wear leather because uh, I think you know animals. Uh, we 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 need to be a little bit more distri- distri- more respectful towards our fellow beings. But anyway, that aside, so on this hunting safari, um, one of the things that they wanted to do was to shoot elephants. And I, the only reason I took the job was because I wanted to find out what is it that drove people to do this sort of thing? Mm-hmm. Where is the fun in shooting and killing wild animals? What, what, where, mm-hmm. where are the kicks in that? What do they get out of it? Yeah. So I did, and and the main guy who was ahead of this was an extraordinarily wealthy person who, who had invented the hula hoop, which was a huge, um, um, yeah. uh, you know, fad around keep the it, world. Keep it fad, yeah. And the frisbee, you know, oh, those wow. were, yeah, those were made by his company here in San Bernardino, which is part of LA. And um, so I met Spud, nice guy, very nice guy, but you know, a hunter. And I wanted, I wanted to find out what made them tick. So I went along on this trip and one of the hunters was not a very good shot. And when it came time for him to shoot his elephant, he missed. The, our main uh, hunting guide uh, pointed out an elephant to him. And when he shot at that elephant, he missed. And so the whole herd went absolutely crazy. And there was a mother, uh, a female with a baby. And she decided to charge us. And this, by the way, was predicted by the Nganga way, way back, because one of the things she told me when I was in her room that in the little hut that day was, be careful of the beast in the forest because it will try to kill you. It, you will be in the way of the great beast. I had no idea what she meant. And I said to David, what beast? What's she talking about? He couldn't find out, but she predicted this. This beast will come for you and you will nearly die. So anyway, it comes 1967, and now this cow elephant is charging us, and I'm behind a camera and a tripod, mm. and this animal is running straight towards me at full charge with every intention of killing us because she thinks that we're going to attack her baby. Sure, her sure. Yeah. And anyway, the white hunter shot her virtually eight feet away from where I was standing. I mean, the, the, the ground was thundering and there was dust everywhere. And in my viewfinder, all I could see was her, her face and her eyes getting bigger and bigger and bigger as she came for me. And she was hit right in her forehead by the bullet and she collapsed to her knees. And I put, put, took the camera off the tripod and shot the rest of it all handheld because uh, it was the only way to do that. The tripod was limiting me. And she eventually fell down and her eyes were locked on mine. She held me in her gaze and her eyes glazed over and she passed away. I felt a connection with that animal and myself when this unbelievably emotional moment was, was mm-hmm. going on. It felt like hours, but of course it might have taken maybe 10 minutes at the most before she died. She didn't take her eyes off me for one moment. And I felt that the spirit of that poor animal had almost joined mine. Uh-huh. And I thought, and, and it, it was like an overwhelming feeling. And that night um, I was aware, I, I felt that something about me had gone through a metam- metamorphosis. I, something had changed in my, the fiber of my being. This animal was now part of who I was. Wow. Anyway, um, many, many times when I had seen other um, Sangomas who threw bones for me, they had always said, there is an elephant in your, in your spirit here. I can, there's an elephant with you. And Ndlovu is the African, the Zulu word for, for elephant, Ndlovu. And many, many times I had Zulu um, uh, um, um, Sangomas read my bones and go like this, say, you have a Ndlovu with you. Mm. And that made me realize that, you know, there's more to this than, the, as the Americans would say, than a bread basket. This is for real. Something's going on here that I don't quite understand. And I became extremely respectful of the fact that we are all connected. 
mm. in some very mysterious and very real way that may not be visible and may not be tangible, but it's absolutely so. We are all connected in some way or another. And, you know, um, it gave me a new way of sensing and seeing and moving through the world and understanding, you know, people and situations. It sure, gives you sure. respect. And so you talk about a force. You talk about, is this the same thing when you talk about that the world contains a force? I mean, I, in my book, I actually give it a character, which is unconditional love, because I actually yeah. think that's the most powerful force that there is and that we can all benefit from that if we just let it benefit us. But yeah. you, you talk about the force. So you would say that we're not just connected, as Jung would say, through the collective unconscious with each other. Yeah. You're saying that, that that force, that connection extends beyond into all elements of nature. But, but that's been a real connection for you. It's not a hypothetical, theoretical no, thing. It's absolutely so. It's as real okay. as the screen I'm looking at and you now. It, it exists. I am absolutely convinced that it, it exists. Uh, and if you, uh, I, I, in the little notes that you gave me, I'm not sure if you're going to get there, but um, <laughs> you know, if you wanted me to read a little passage from the book, I end the book with that statement. Okay. About, well, we um, will. We'll definitely have that. About my interpretation of that. And yeah, we're all connected. We're all part of the same grid. Yes. And okay. I think, and I think it's cosmic. It's not just here. It's yeah, it's, yeah. Well, a, well, Young Young was very specific on this. He said that, you know, the archetypes and not just present within our own unconscious um, archetypes exist across the whole universe. Absolutely. And, yeah. And that um, that's how we connect to the universe is, is through, through the unconscious. So in a way, when the elephant's lying there looking you in the eyes and it's her spirit, her unconscious, if you like, communicating beyond the consciousness of your mind yes. into the... But that seems to inspire the self, though, hasn't it? So, yes. If you, if, yes. So, do you want to just well, say a little bit more about how that inspired the, the self? In the sense of, of of giving you a profound respect for everything, hmm. um, not taking anything for granted, and always trying to go beneath the onion layers, the skin of a topic, a subject, a person, whatever the 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 the, the film or the subject may be that I'm working on. You've got to go and probe as deep as you possibly can, but you've got to go there with profound respect for everything, whether you agree with it or not. Yeah. And I think that that has been a life lesson that has paid off because it, it, it has allowed me to burrow into people's lives. People have let me into their lives in ways that have astonished me and told me, you know, the, the inner secrets of who they are. Yes. Because they feel comfortable maybe with, uh, my approach and my approach is based entirely on the fact that I come to them with a profound sense of of respect and I don't yes. use a soppy way at all I mean I no. really do I know what you mean um we are in the alchemy lab everybody and Lionel I did sort of prime you for this so we're we've got a bit of a concoction going on in here um here's a bit of cut glass crystal which is one of the metaphors in The Alchemist by Paolo Kahlo. If you've read the book, then you'll, you'll know where this illusion is coming from. So I'm trying to create a potion in here with you and I'm asking for your help. So if I'm to hear the universe at those decision-making moments in my life, um, what, what ingredients do I need to put in, in, in here? I'll just give it a bit of a, a stir here now, but. So I've, I'm ready, we're all ready, Lionel. If we want to know how to listen to, do we have to go to Africa and listen to the bones? Or are there other things that you would recommend we can do? I think we can do this anywhere at all. We don't have to go, you don't have to go to a place of worship. Okay. You don't have to go to a building designated to some sort of religious path or- Yeah, or deity, again. yeah. Uh, you can do this anywhere. You can do this on the top of the Empire State Building. You can do this in the middle, middle of Trafalgar Square, or you can do this in the middle of the Mojave Desert, which is what I do very, very often. I just go out into the desert and I just get out and sit in the desert. And I think the most important thing that for me is silence. Cut out 
any distractions and any noise and let the universe speak to you directly. Silence is so important. We are so drowned all the time. We are, we are overwhelmed by this cackle and crackle of noise and commercialism and the around us all the time. It's traffic, it's crowds, it's, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's advertising. It, it, it drives you insane. And, uh, you know, I think cl classical music is an amazing way to uh, find some inner peace within yourself. Uh, you know, when and, 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 I, and, and, and I do this very, very often, but I think the most important thing is to try and find a moment of silence. And you can do this anywhere. You can do this in the middle of a busy city. You can do this anywhere. I have done it at sea, in a storm-tossed sea where I thought we, the ship was going to capsize and it almost did. And that's one of the stories that I tell in the book, yeah. which the woman foretold, by the way. She said, the big water will try to kill you. And I was on this, this, this research ship that almost capsized in the South wow. Atlantic. Oh, wow. Okay, that must have been a storm because they're and, really built to survive. So. And they are built to survive, but it was mm. absolutely terrifying. And even then, mm. you know, at that, in, in those conditions, if you find a little moment to just go within and make that connection, because we mm -hmm. can all do that. We can mm -hmm. all do that at any time. And we don't need a book of instructions. We, have, we carry the instructions. We have that. We're blessed with that, you know. We do have freedom of choice, uh, we humans, you know, we're very lucky to have that. Um, not all creatures have that um, gift or, or, or as fortunate as that, um, but we have a sense of choice and all we need to do is to choose to go within and tap into the resources that are available to us at any time we need it, at any time we want it and draw upon it. Marvelous, okay. Here's your moment then, um, your quote, if you will, um, from, from your book. You say it comes towards the end. Of it. Have you got your book there with you? Have you got the, I've got the book, yes, the book is yeah, right hold up. Yes, hold it up for the viewers that, that are on YouTube, forever in my veins. What's the subtitle? The subtitle is How Film Led Me to the Mysterious World of the African Shaman. It's a great cover, love the cover. Um, um, and so everybody, just FYI, you can pre-order uh, Lionel's book now. It's available in all great online bookshops, including yes. Barnes & Noble, Waterstones, yes. Amazon. Your your local bookstore even can order it yes. for you. Let's support and, and, and do, our do local support, bookstores. <laughs> do support your local bookstore. We've got yes. to keep the local bookstores alive, particularly now with this pandemic. We've got to try and keep these people going. And I mean, there's nothing more important than the local bookstore. Uh, the chains are wonderful, but you know, please let's let's keep local small bookstores alive and well. And so let me read to you what I say here at the very end. Uh, it's basically the, the epilogue. Um, you know, um, I constantly look back in amazement at the long road that has taken me from South African towns creaking under the immoral weight of apartheid to the boulevards and movie factories of Los Angeles. I know now too that the world is infinitely more mysterious and paradoxical than I could ever have imagined. It's filled with extraordinary and unknowably wondrous things. It's easy to get depressed about the state of international affairs, but for me, optimism and hope far outweigh the negative. Sometimes I see our very existence as a gigantic bumper cars, fairground attraction. Remember the bumper cars at the yeah. fair? Right. My favorite. Yeah. So with riders buzzing around in brightly colored electrically powered vehicles as they dodge and swerve into one another, the experience creates fear and thrill and laughter. And at the back end of each of those cars is a whip-like antenna, you know, that sticks up with a metal contact at its tip. The tip brushes along a wire mesh or grid suspended above the ride. And that is the power source that, that supplies the power to drive the vehicle. It's from there that the electricity powers the car. And I think in some way or another, every single living entity, whether it be people or ponies or petunias, we're all connected to a similar grid. And I really firmly do believe this, but it exists on a level beyond the physical, beyond our capacity to see it. It's a vast force field that extends throughout the cosmos. We're all bound by it. It transcends time and place, but who or what controls the power and what exactly is the purpose of the ride? Well, I think those are the sort of questions that we are here 
to try to find out. And I think that's one of the reasons for our being. We've got to find the answer. You know, I often think about this, um, about um, hacking your way through a, a field of, of green, tall green grass on the, uh, on the, on the plains of East Africa. Yeah. And you want yeah. to get to the other side. <clears throat> but the more you cut your way into it, the, 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 more, the longer you realize your journey really is. There's still so much more to find out. Yes. The journey is still, there's still so much more to go. You'll never get to the other side. And that's the purpose. We've got to keep finding, going to the, towards the other side, knowing full well that the other side is perhaps unreachable. But imagine what we discover on our journey. This is what we're here to find out. Jo we're Joseph all... Campbell said that the, the, the purpose of life is not to try and find necessarily the, the reason for, for, for being alive. It is to experience the actualization of being alive. That's exactly that you, right. to know you're alive and yes. that's really the hero's journey in the end of the day and and Lionel, I'm thrilled that you've written this book I cannot recommend it enough to everybody um, I've managed to get through quite a bit of it um, so far but I'm definitely going to finish it because I want to get to the end and and see how all of the Nanga's <laughs> predictions can come to pass but um uh, we wish you the very best with it, and we'd love to have you back next year, maybe. Um, second half of next year, I'm going to be reinventing the, the Alchemy Lab again, and it would be great to have you back. And maybe we can talk further on some of our personal experiences and so on with that. But I'm sorry we've run out of time. Just um, if you want to hold the book up one more time, Lionel, everybody go and grab Lionel's good pre-order now, available at the local bookshop or online. Uh, published by John Hunt Publishing, and uh, my deepest, serious, uh, sincere thanks to you, Lionel, today for spending the time to thank be you. on the Alchemy Lab. Thank uh, you. Thank you. It's been wonderful. I do appreciate it so much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of the day.